Hey, welcome to my desk today. It is a cold and rainy day here in the mountains and I have pulled out all of my paints and today we are going to go through them. I'm going to do some color swatching and some comparisons and yeah, I'm just going to show you what what I uncover here and what I like to use. I'm Kat Riles. I'm an artist and painter in the mountains of North Carolina, and I'm so glad you are here today. thing for us to do is to split this up into colors. I've already arranged them into kind of color families, but I think if I try to do all of these colors in one video, it's going to be way too much. So I'm going to move this tray out. We will save those for later. I've also got my neutrals and these are some more of my neutrals. And that leaves us with the blues. I'm gonna go into some of these, probably in a different video. I'm actually in the process of trying to add some um, that I'm excited about. And then these are some of my more opaque colors. We'll do those another day as well. So here we are with our blues. I have a mixture of um, Daniel Smith paints, Holbein, and one or two May Mary Blue. My Mary Blue? How do you say it? I'm not sure. But some of these are my everyday go-to colors. And then I also have some in here that are extra and will probably be rehomed. Um, especially after doing this video and going through them. There are some that I like to keep and there are some that I just know I'm not going to use them so I'd rather send them to someone that is going to use them. So let me rearrange here a little bit better. I've got my ultramarine blues. These are the same, my cobalt teals. I'm going to put my indigos together. Midnight blue, it's in this family down here. I also will put this Payne's Gray in this same family. Am I in screen? Let me double check. Yeah, okay, you can see that. Um, so anything that's in this really deep, dark, rich blue is gonna go down here. This is another ultramarine. I've got this horizon, horizon blue, cerulean blue, chromium, Jane's gray, and Payne's gray. They're gonna go right here. And I guess I'll put this My Mary Blue over here in their family, even though it's some kind of a bridge between indigo and what comes right beside indigo is actually Indian throne well in comparison to the Daniel Smith is made from Indian throne and then this one is made from phthalo blue and I don't use that one very much so you can see here I actually don't have a huge variety variety can be overwhelming for me so I'm going to start here. I did a little bit of comparing yesterday for myself, but what does that mean if you weren't there? So let's start just with my extras that don't get used very often. Um, that I like to have them. I think they're very fun, especially for sketchbook use. Do I have you? I don't have it out. Um, I don't even have it in a palette, but this is the Holbein Horizon Blue, which I've just had a vision. I really, I don't know why I wanted this, but I, it isn't the most light fast. It's two stars out of four, I believe. So I, it would be a sketchbook color for me. Um, but it's a beautiful, beautiful blue. I believe it has white in it. So it has a little bit of opacity. It's not as transparent as most of your blues, but it just, when you need a sky blue, 
you need a sky blue, horizon blue. So I'm going to set it over here as just one of my fun extras that I, I get to keep it because I really want to. And this is manganese blue hue. This is a hue. I think it is in the, no. No, it's not in the palette. I thought it was. And it also has this really vibrant color. I think I got really into these because it was after I went to the beach and the sea and saw all these beautiful turquoise. I traveled a little bit last year this time and I just was like, I don't have anything that compares to this. But manganese blue, blue Nova, it's a hue of manganese, is this version is definitely made with phthalo blue. So in essence, I kind of have phthalo blue. Um, I'll go ahead and swatch out phthalo blue. So it's just a lighter version of that. It's not going to get any darker. Having phthalo blue is going to give you some deeper, deeper values, but then you can still wash it out to similar. It's not wanting to blend out as well. But yeah, that's the blue shade of phthalo blue. So you can kind of get the same Wow, that really flattened out on this paper. This is the Paul Rubens Cotton Sketchbook. I don't love working in it um, because of these, these little ledges with the perforation, which can be great for some people, but for me, it just feels more like a workbook, like for squatching, squatching, swatching, and um, kind of making decisions around paint. So let's jot this down really quickly so this is horizon blue in the wet by whole line and manganese so I don't have any other versions of these colors to compare to it's only going to get interesting towards the end green shade Daniel Smith okay so those are the bright brilliant blues and the next family of bright brilliant blues is definitely cobalt teal cobalt teal blue this color so this is where you're gonna really be able to see what granulation is in comparison to these ultra ultra um, smooth pigments So you can see how this color is separating and the heavy particles are beginning to kind of settle. So I love this one for its granulation. I love mixing it with other colors just to get that separation. It is so separating that it'll do kind of wild things when you mix it with other, other pigments. So that's the Cobalt Teal Blue by Daniel Smith. And this one is definitely in my palette and it looks like I have the backup tube so she is ready to go. I'm gonna clamp it together just so I don't make a mess in my watercolor box. All right, next we already did phthalo blue. So here's, here's where it can get, no, only slightly interesting because I have ultramarine and then this is, these are the same. This is the ultramarine deep by My Mary Blue. So I want to compare those two together. This is my Daniel Smith. Maybe, is it? Maybe it's not. Um, this is Daniel Smith Ultramarine Blue. I'll put them down here. So let's do that and then let's see if I just grab some water. How does it disperse? This is also a very granulating color. Shady. And then we'll compare it to this My Mary Blue. This one's called Ultramarine Deep. 
but it's not that much darker or deeper. If you're thinking it's gonna be darker, which is kind of what I had in mind, but it almost seems a little bit closer to purple, so it has more warm undertones than the other version. But they're both PB29, right? Yeah. PB29. And I should have written down the looking at how it disperses. How does it lay on a page? How do I like it? Okay, those are done. I like them. I think those are all good quality paints to keep in my collection. The next one that lives in its own family for me is the Cerulean Blue Chromium. And I'll just swatch it out on this top row. I have my backup tube. I like that it's an earthier blue, so it's one of these really bright ones, but you can tell here compared to this row that it's a little more subtle, like it's not as brilliant. Um, also very granulating, like the cobalt teal and like the ultramarine blue. What's funny is, I guess if you looked at my studio palette here, all of my blues, these three right here, are all the granulating ones, so. I like granulating blues. These are really pretty too, but in terms of how I use my sketchbooks every day, I'll keep them, but they're not in my everyday palette. They're in this thick one over here. Well, they're not, are they? No, my phthalo blues over there. Okay, let's go on to this really fun. Things are about to get deeper. Maybe I'll move my deeper colors over here. I'll put these over here. Let's go ahead and do Mayan Blue Genuine from Daniel Smith. This is not a color that I use really at all. Ooh, it leans a little more gray for me, which can be good. It just... I've tried it in my palettes in the past, but it never, it, it hasn't, it hasn't stuck for me. So it's, it's not one that I feel like I need. It is a deeper blue. So in some senses it could compete with the indigos in a way. It's a more natural grayer blue. But it's just not my favorite. It's not my favorite for mixing. Um, I'm always thinking about what mixes do I like to make. And it can, ri it can rival this family of colors. So here's the next family of colors. These I love. I love End and Throne Blue. But when I, I'm working with just a limited palette, I, I typically will choose an indigo over the end and throw, which Daniel Smith makes its indigo. Oh goodness, she's gonna want me to call her back. It's so gorgeous. It's cool, no, it's warm. I always get confused. When you're looking at blues, you're always just thinking it's a cool color. Um, so you have to think, does it lean more red or does it lean more like ice? Does that make sense? I ran out of space on my phone. So while it was trying to like buffer between the cloud and deleting things, I went ahead and swatched these darker blues um, that could be in the indigo family. 
I'm calling some of them in the indigo family and I'll show you why in just a second. Um, mainly uh, because, so I put the, the colors down here. I forgot to put down the Jane's Gray. I'm pretty sure it's PB29 and PBR7. Yeah, PB29 and PBR7. Um, because, as always, I'm thinking about how are they going to mix and which ones are going to give me the most options. So over here, I choose one, two, three. I really like the way that this one has um, granulated, but it's maybe almost too pink for mixing, especially for making greens. I wonder how that's going to mix. Um, but over here, so Indian Throne is PB60. Now, Midnight Blue, this is American Journeys. They have beautiful paints. You can see here how just yummy and juicy they are. It's made from Indian Throne and a little bit of Cronacridone Violet, PB, PV19. Now over here for Daniel Smith Indigo it has some lamp black mixed with Indian Throne, which is also the same two pigments at different you know quantities they use for their paints blue gray. So that's why these are so similar. It's definitely why I wouldn't have both of these in my palette, and probably why I wouldn't have both of these in my palette or all three of these. I would choose one. Um, I don't keep black in my palette, so if I had Indian Throne and I wanted to make an indigo on my own, I would have to kind of figure it out and maybe pre-mix some things. I'm actually very curious what Indian Throne and my brown iron oxide that I use all the time look like mixed together. I'm going to mix them on the page here. So instead of using black, I'm going to use brown. beautiful and the brown that I use the environmentally friendly brown iron oxide I really like because it is so super granulating so you get a little bit of warm tones and then you get this nice deep blue so those might be a nice combination if you just wanted to keep a brilliant blue in your palette that will also be able to make greens so you want to think I'm grabbing a piece of paper here for us. So you want to think about how many options do I have with this color? So if I'm just choosing one of these, which is what I do in my palette, I have this one space for a deep blue. Um, if I'm choosing the Indian Throne, I can quickly mix it with my brown and get like a very deep indigo type color, but it's going to separate. That can be good or it could be negative. I could also probably mix this Indian Throne. Let's see. I mixed it with, let's see what kind of greens I can get with the Indian Throne and my favorite Ariolan. Oh, that's really nice. So I get a really pretty sappy green. So that's a really nice option. I might have to go back to the end of the turn. Oh my goodness, too many choices. Um, so you can see there how I've, I can get to a very moody blue. I mean, in and of itself, it's very moody. Or if I come down here to this cooler indigo, which is the Holbein, which is made from phthalo blue, which is why it's cooler, um, and black, and a little bit of uh, the Cronacridon magenta, the formulation that Holbein uses for Quinacridone Magenta, which is the most light fast one, which is why that is the Quinacridone Magenta in my palette. So I want to show, oops, that's a lot because it's wet. That same mixture combination with the Aurelion. So you're going to get a very different kind of green here.
that's really pretty that's really nice um, but you also want to think about well what do I get when I mix that yellow with one of my other blues am I getting all the variety in the world so I'm gonna go back over here because I want the widest variety I can get over just like oh that's the pretty one um, so those, those maybe seem more similar. What are your thoughts? Add a little bit more yellow there. I mean, you can just tell how, like, you can get such a nice deep color. Now there is a benefit to having the single pigment over this multiple pigment. I'm going to grab some of that paint, drag it down here, and go for quinacridone gold. Earthy, earthy yellow. So I get some nice variation there. And not only do I want to compare it to the blue, but also to the green I keep in palette. The one that I'll mix a lot of greens from is my Perlene green compared mixing it with the yellow. So if I'm not careful, I'm going to forget all these mixes. I mean, that's such a crisp color. That's really pretty. This is a little cooler. This one still leans a little bit cool. Those are kind of similar. That's just with the areolin. And then let's try this with That's different. I mean, that's why I love that mix. That's why I like that option. But I also keep green gold on here too, which gives you a really, really, really bright color. Okay, so what am I, what am I considering here? That's a really pretty kind of turquoise you get in the center there. But it's similar kind of to mixing phthalo green with the quinacridone magenta. Interesting. I knew that looked a little familiar. So I'm going to get that kind of same shade here. So I already have that color on my palette. towards the Indian throne. What's happening? What has happened? So these are, let's write it down because I'm going to forget. We've got, this is Holbein Indigo. This is Indian throne. Ultramarine blue. green plus Quinn magenta. And I put that one down there just because it gets us kind of in that family. Um, it won't get us to a bright green like that, but we'll get similar turquoise and teal. Okay, so if we wanted to look at the Daniel Smith indigo, just this one right here on my palette. I love that color. I love it on its own. So that's the beauty of the indigo is I just kind of, sometimes I do use that one just as she is. And then you get much more olive green right out of the bat. Cause you've got the black mixed in with it. Ooh, man, I still love Still love my Indigo by Daniel Smith. Um, let's check my Indigo with Quinacridone Gold so we can keep everything similar. Yeah, 
get that real nice muddy pea, muddy pea green. I think that's what I would call it. Yeah, so if I was choosing between which family of greens that I really lean towards, it would be these down here. It would be these here. Now, one thing that I can do that I'm thinking about doing is making my own mixture from this indigo that's made from the phthalo blue, which would be nice to have, kind of having a cooler color in my palette. Um, let's see what she looks like mixed with the brown. Ooh, went too brown. So while this is wet, I can actually mix something to put in to create my own formula that I like. Let's try it with some burnt sienna. Kind of leans a little bit more. So then if I took that, That looks like indigo to me, but if I was, do I have the same mixing power, power with that here? Oh, that's nice. Huh. Okay, so what did I do? I did a little bit of brown and a little bit of burnt sienna with this blue. So I could create my own special mixture there, which I'm tempted to do, because I actually like this over that. I like this over that. It's not going to be as crisp and clear and clean as any of these because it's got that granulation, but I could, instead of using the brown iron oxide, I could mix it with burnt umber, which is also a warm brown, but it doesn't granulate. Or I could do like the sepia, PBK6, and the R7. Or I could try it with raw umber. I never use raw umber. That would be a way to use my raw umber. But I like the green that that one makes. I'm not upset about that. Let's see. Let's see how she does. A little bit of raw umber. Woo! So brown. Chocolate. even seeing what I'm doing here. That makes a nice green mixed with the raw umber, but I don't love that as a mass tone. Um, hmm. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? I think, I think I'm just going to, let's, let's mix a little bit more. Let's see what we think might nice. Let's try it with the Burnt Umber, which is uh, PBR7. So I never have Burnt Sienna and Burnt Umber in the same palette because they're so similar. I mean, they're made from the same pigment. They're not the same color, but they are very, very similar. But you can get a lot more depth with Burnt Umber, but I love Burnt Sienna. So I typically will pick the Burnt Sienna. A little bit too brown. Add more blue. It's still very different from that. Hmm. That's a nice blue. What am I trying to do? What am I doing here? I'm not sure. Very nice, very nice. 
Wow, that's really pretty. I mean, it's an example of if I had this blue in my palette, I could push it and get different colors by what's in my palette. What did I mix with this one with? The brown and the burnt sienna. So even if it's not something, I can dig right out and go into mixing. I could pretty quickly get it to lean a little bit for me. Um, I think one of the questions though with indigo, and the reason you have indigo on a palette is, is to kind of drop it in to these little spots here. So this is not a great painting. Maybe I should get a sketchbook. Not my favorite sketchbook. It's funny, these are the same papers, but this behaves so differently than this. You just never know what you're gonna get. Um, let's go here. See, I like the way this turned out. But let's see what dropping in this blue. This is the Holbein Indigo. When paints are wet, they just really, it's hard not to get too much of them. So that just has a very different feel than the blue that I'm used to for indigo because I've been using the Daniel Smith indigo. Does it mean it's bad? No, it just means it's different. Is that a shade I could get used to? Let's see what it looks like when we drop in End and Throne as a mass tone instead. Which one do I prefer? how brilliant the end and turn is. Hmm. You know, doing things like this makes me question everything. Okay, let's think about the way that we work. I pick up indigo in this palette because I'm looking for something that is just deep and dark, but it's a little more blue than the Payne's Blue Gray or a Jane's Gray or any kind of like Payne's Gray. Um, I'm looking for something that has a little bit more interest, but it is, maybe I'm just so used to this. Um, let's look at what the End and Throne looks like mixed with brown. What, if, what are we doing? Are we just gonna confuse ourselves? I don't remember what's happening. So we're gonna add End of the Throne. Cause this is what I could do instead of mixing, or instead of having this mix, I could use the End of the Throne and create my own indigo mix. My own very personal indigo mix. Oh, that's nice. Oh goodness, maybe that's what I feel like indigo should look like. But maybe I'll try it. I'm going to try it also with the raw umber and the burnt umber and do one that's not granulating. Because it's good to have some colors that are not granulating. Ooh. Oh, that's really nice. Still, uh oh, do I want to hear the brown one? Uh, let's write down which one that is. I'm gonna forget the order. 
so these are all endanthrin plus brown iron oxide raw umber and then over here we'll do endanthrin plus burnt umber and maybe just for good measure we could do it with burnt sienna we'll see I'm not sure Texture of this paper really makes the paint interesting. So that one, maybe it's, maybe it just didn't get as much paint. So I was gonna say it looks lighter. I just think I had it. More watered down. Hmm. So that is with the burnt umber. Guess what I'm leaning towards? And let's put it beside the indigo that I use every day. beautiful. It's similar to the indigo. Kind of like it with the raw umber. This one seems like it separates less even though that's with the granulating. Maybe if I mixed these more or if I added more of the endanthrin. It's all about proportions perhaps is the right word. Maybe I'll mix this one. I'm gonna try to mix that one up myself. End and thrown, burnt umber. And let's see if we can make a green with it. Or does it just go? No, that's not bad. And that's with my bright crisp yellow. I like that. I like that more than I like this. I want to make this Holbein work, but I'll need to figure it out though. Okay, I'm gonna leave this today. I think this is enough. I think this is a long enough video, but I think I'm gonna mix my own indigo with burnt umber and Indian thorn. And I mean, I hope should still be light fast if they're both light fast colors they are because that's what I use and see how how I like how this goes the reason I'm doing that perhaps most importantly is because I have this whole tube of Indian Throne I have a tube and a little bit of Indian Throne I have these browns I'm not gonna put burnt umber in my palette because I really love the brown iron oxide I'll show you really quickly. If you're so curious the difference, I don't know if you are. This is brown iron oxide. So rich and chocolatey brown and granulating. This is burnt umber. Similar, warm, warmer not as granulating so I feel like I have like more depth with this brown it, I can get darker colors darker mixtures a little more quickly and then compared to the raw umber so it's not gonna have the same warmth because it's not burnt Ooh, just 
there is this is a very useful color to have it can it can really make fast grays it's because it doesn't have the warmth um, of the other but I'm gonna lean towards this one is kind of in between the two if you were mix if you were to mix those two together I feel like this is what you get and that is what I want all right thank you for joining me I hope you enjoyed just some color exploration with me and looking over how I make choices of what goes in my palette and I'm gonna get back to you I'm gonna think some more about this indigo and how I would use it in my palette I've got it in this acorn and what I'll do is I'll stick it on my palette and kind of pick it up every once in a while and give it some some turns in my sketchbook um but for the most part when this goes down when this indigo is down because I'm pretty much out I can still get more but I might put it in a different palette um I'm gonna give I'm gonna give something else a whirl but yeah these are my my three main blues oh, I'm just making a mess and yeah Thanks so much. I'll see you soon. Thank you so much for joining me on this cold and rainy day. And I hope that that wasn't too much of a ramble, but I'm really excited. I love to talk about these things um, because I think about them a lot. I spend my evenings and my days um, tweaking things down to what really works for me and kind of trying to keep it as simple and as easy and as functional as possible. Thank you for being here. Um, if you feel in, inspired to follow, I love that. If you want to go check out my Patreon, you can do that as well. I have a really fun art club that I'm just getting started, so it's very brand new, um, but that's a way we can kind of paint and inspire and connect um, through that platform. Also go check out my website. I've got lots of art and lots of prints. I've got an online sketchbook class and I just love finding this community here. So thank you so much and I'll see you next time. Bye.